Hello and welcome to this introduction to Sapphire Lens Flare. My name is Ben Brownlee from Curious Turtle. A well thought out lens flare can really make a huge difference to your project. But as you can see with this scene, if you choose a wrong lens flare, and in this case we're using the default Adobe lens flare, it's just going to look out of place. Whereas a more appropriate and well designed lens flare will actually come in and add a bit more atmosphere to the scene rather than detract from it. And we're going to start off in the Sapphire Flare Designer so we can see how we can find an appropriate lens flare and then customize it for our needs. Give it a bit of animation and a bit of life and then bring it in to our project. So in the Flare Designer, on the left hand side, we have our Flare presets. And if I open this up a little bit, you can see we have tabs for the new flares, the featured flares, our own favorite flares, flare components, which we'll come back to, but the sort of building blocks to add to our flares. Or we can have a look at all the flare presets, which are either the ones that come bundled with Sapphire or the ones that you save yourself. I'll just pop into my favorites here for the moment. Now I'll be adding this flare to a motion graphic scene. So I want a sort of anamorphic flare that's got lots of nice little stripes and streaks. So I've got, uh, I've got a few to choose from here. I've got this one, which is based off the Sankor 16 lens, which is, uh, which is kind of nice or the, uh, the Cook anamorphic lens. And what I like about these lens flares is that they sort of dance as you move them around. So they've got lots of, uh, lots of elements here, but um, I'll actually start with the, the anamorphic energy here. I think this is, uh, this is gonna be the one, it's a very, uh, very bold, unabashed lens flare like this one. If we look a little bit further over to the right, we can see the different flare elements that make this up. And these are created in groups, so we can open up these groups at any time and just see those different flare elements that are going on inside there. It also makes it very easy for me to turn on and off certain group elements. So say we only want the blue streaks, we can turn off our red multi-spots right there. But let's turn everything back on. Now, of course, just because we're starting with a preset doesn't mean we have to keep everything as the preset has it. We can always add or remove custom elements as we need to. And we can find our different flare elements up at the top here. So I can add different types of rays. I can add chroma rings or multi streaks. Or I can add another ring in here. And let's do that. Let's add a ring and we'll come over to the properties here. I can even give this a name. I can call this one. I'll call this one large faint ring. And let's start to customize this up a bit. Now, I often find it's more useful when you're starting to add elements in is to just solo the selection down at the bottom of the viewer here. And this lets us just see what that one element is actually doing. So we can change its position, which is how it moves. So you can see with a position of minus one, it's actually mirroring where the hotspot is around the pivot point, which in this case is in the center. And if I take this to zero, you can see that wherever I move my hotspot, it's actually going to stay with the pivot. If I have this set to one, it's going to be following the hotspot. So like that selection one more time. But a big white ring probably isn't the most interesting element that we could possibly use. So let's come down. We can start to change this up a little bit. Obviously, I can change up the size of this ring here and the relative height and width of it. Or I can use the stretch here as well, which will just stretch this either horizontally or vertically. Move that up a little bit more and you can sort of see what the... Uh, what the aspect ratio changes to. Let's have quite a big stretch there. I can even add distortion into here. So this adds a little bit of a natural kind of curvature to it, which, um, which I actually really like. With regards to color and brightness, we can use one of the presets here to make this into a sort of chroma ring of various sort of shades, or we can use any of these other saved gradients that we have. When anything's black, it's going to be reduce the brightness down. So obviously that bit of the ring is going to be darker and where it's white is going to be brighter. So using these black stops here is a very nice way of just softening out the edges a bit. So if I had, if I, let's double click on one of these end points here, turn that to white. You can see I have a very, very sharp inner edge here and it fades out at the end. And you see, because I've got my gradient fading out there, but that's just going to fade out and give us a nice smooth fall off there. Let's close all of these up. I'll come back to animation and noise in a little bit. So I want to have a look at texture overlay. Now, if we have a look up at our top elements here, we can actually import textures as a flare element. 
it will bring up the finder or explorer window so we can find our elements that we want to use and we can just import that in. I'm just going to uh, trash this for a second because I want to show you a different way of actually using these textures. Because instead of importing a texture in as an element itself, we can actually use a texture overlay on top of any of these other elements. And this can be a real secret for designing unique and gorgeous lens flares. So I'm going to load in a texture overlay over the top of this one. I'll pick this Caustic 6 and I'll just change the scale factor on that so we can actually see it. I might have to change the color and the brightness up a little bit now. So you can see that a bit clearer. When we import a texture, we can actually maintain the color aspect of it. So some part of that texture can be color and some part of it can be black and white. And it's only going to be the black and white elements. They're going to take on the color of my color and brightness. So you can see this little blue area here. That is going to stay blue no matter what I set this color stop to. And you can see that there. Now, if I use the color stop up at the top to give it an overall color, then it's going to add the overall color over the top of that. So that might not be what you're after. But let's, uh, let's actually cancel that and leave that at white. So we've got this nice colored element going on here. So doing it this way can give us a really unique sort of texture that would be tricky to create just using the other properties. And let's see how that's going to fit in context now. Let's add all the other elements in. And I can see I'm going to want to reduce the brightness down. So now I've got this relatively how I want it to. Let's, uh, let's see how this is going to look in context. So I can come in and maybe change the colors up so it fits the color scheme on the rest of the flare. I can change the brightness up. I can maybe adjust the size up as well. It's a large, soft, faint element that's just giving us a little bit of something. There we go, something like that. Just another little thing, just adding a little bit more life into the flare, sort of like that. Now, why is it that some elements react to the edges and other ones don't? Now, the reason for that is actually because it's in this area that we skipped over a little while ago, and it's in this animation here. And this animation area is possibly one of the most important areas to, uh, to learn and to master because it's here where the flares really kind of gain their life and start looking like natural organic flares rather than this style of lens flare, which has been banging around for over 20 years. So let's add an element and quickly look over this animation. So I'm just going to add a, a simple spot. There we go. And you'll notice that when it moves over the center, it triggers something here and when it moves over the edge it triggers something there as well and the reason we're seeing this is not only do we have animation automatically on here but in our preview mode if we take a look down at the bottom we have all triggers turned on we can just see edge triggers so this will only show what the animation is going to be doing at the edges or we could just have center triggers so we can only see what happens when the center trigger is turned on or we can have no triggers here. And the thing about these flares and the animation as well is that even if we set this animation up, it's up to us when we go into the host whether these triggers are doing anything. But moving over to the animation, there are two different areas to look for. We have the brightness response and the width response. So I've just wanted it to go brighter uh, and not scale up, I can set my width response down to zero. And then just as we go over the edge, it's just going to brighten up. But we wanted it to do nothing when it hit those triggers. We could just set both of those to zero and it would do absolutely nothing. The other thing we've got to animate is the relationship it has between our flare element, in this case the spot, and the pivot point. And here we could use the auto size. So if I set my auto size to one, when I'm directly at the pivot point, my flare element here is gonna be very, very small. And as I move further away from it, it's going to move up in size until it reaches its final size and grows up there. 
if I set my size direction to shrink, is that when it's at its uh, center point here, it's at its normal size. And as I move further and further away, it gets smaller and smaller. And we can adjust that rate of change just by taking out also size scale down. And so it takes longer to reach zero. If we take that to 0 0.5, it's gonna disappear when it hits the edge. There we go. And that could be either side or even vertically as well. And we could do the same with brightness as well. So we can have it brightening up as it moves further and further away or darkening down so that it just fades away as it moves away from the center point. If we want to sort of delay that a bit so it doesn't just start animating down as we, uh, as we leave this pivot point, I can just change the auto scale delay a little bit there. And I'll change that to 0 0.25. It will stay exactly the same until I'm halfway between the pivot point and the edge here. And then it will start to scale down there. Because when it comes to animation, we don't just have to apply this to a single element. We can apply this to a group as well. Because I've got multiple elements doing multiple things already in this group, in the hotspot group. But at any point, I can just set a multiplier on these values to make that more or less extreme. And getting full mastery of this animation, how this animation works, will really give you an advantage in creating interesting and gorgeous looking lens flares. Now we've taken a very brief look over the properties. Let's save this one out, actually use this in a project. So I am going to call this Ben's, Ben's Anamorphic Monster and call this Customized Anamorphic Fun. So when we're saving out a preset, we have the same sort of options as when we're saving out any Sapphire preset. We get to give it a good description. We also get to come in and give it some characteristics. So in this case, it's uh, bright. It's quite extreme. I'd say this falls under lighting. And it's a bit red. There we go. So I can save this out either locally or I can export this out to a file. I'm just going to save it locally. And let's come out of the Flare Designer. I'm going to use After Effects for the time being but this works in a similar way, no matter what the host is. Now I can apply my, uh, my lens flare directly to the layer itself. So I want to add a bit of flare to this text here, but instead of applying it to the text itself, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply it to a black clip over the top of that, a black solid, and let's come in and we'll go S lens flare, and I can either load up a preset or I can come into the edit flare and this will pop, pop us back into the flare designer and we'll see our flare presets here. And I can come into all and I can just search for Ben. And there it is, Ben's anamorphic monster. There it is, okay. So hit okay on that. That's cool. I'm just gonna turn my black layer to screen, obviously. And we can just animate this up a little bit. So let's come in here, change my hotspot, add a keyframe. Add a keyframe, there we go. And if we take a look down at the properties here, we still have full control over our properties. So I can still come in, change the scaling up on the overall flare, or if we want to change the flare just on an individual element, of course we can do that. Just by going up into edit lens, taking us back into the flare designer. And what should we do here? Let's take the relative height down on our hotspot here on the hotspot group, there we go. Hit OK on that, and that will update immediately for us. And through the magic of editing, this is what we end up with. Remember, if you want to use the edge and center triggers, that you have to turn this on in the effect controls here in the host. Otherwise, they're not gonna do anything. I will just repeat that another few times for the other effects, and we get our nice, lively, little bit of text. And here we can see the same effect playing back in Premiere. And I've done exactly the same thing, just added the effect to a black video and set that to screen blend mode, and then keyframed it up over in the effects controls. 
Uh, because that's one of the powerful things about working with the flare design editor is that once you have the flare created in there, you can actually use it in whatever host that you need to. Now, if we work in an environment that supports the 3D mode on the uh, S lens flare, then we don't even have to add keyframes to our hotspot. In this example, I've got my clip with a 3D point light in. And on the lens flare, all I've done is set my mode to 3D and chosen which of the lights I want to use. And I can use multiple lights if I have several in my scene. And this will use the properties of that point light to actually affect our flare. And if I bring the intensity of the, the point light up as well, obviously that also affects our flare here too. But this really is just a small taste of what we can do with less lens flare. And I encourage you to go out, take a look at the presets that are available to you and sort of take them apart a little bit and see exactly what they're doing. Or even if you don't want to get too deep into things, you can still just use the components here to build up a nice, interesting custom effect that's going to be absolutely unique to you that you can go and take credit for. My name is Ben Brownie from Curious Turtle, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching, and be sure to go to borisfx.com to download a free trial of Sapphire. Also, subscribe to the Boris YouTube channel by clicking on the link above to stay up to date with the latest information and training materials on all the Boris Effects products.